All right, good morning. So a lot of what I'm going to say this morning is drawn from a book I just published a few months ago. So my marketing director said, be sure to have it on display and remind the audience that it's available not only in hardback, but paperback and Kindle as well. Uh, but so I'm going to talk about money, but uh, by comparison to Tyler's talk, it's going to be much more thematic and sweeping. So the basic idea is to compare different monetary standards that at some level as a society, we have to choose among. So our current status quo is, is technically known as a fiat standard, right? Fiat comes from a Latin word meaning let it be. I have spoken. It's a decree. So a fiat is a decree or a command. It's money by decree or by command by order of the government. So a fiat money is a money that gains its footing, its basis from it being issued by government and it being declared to be the money and often backed up by certain legal restrictions on using alternatives or restrictions against rejecting payment uh, in the government's money. By comparison to a gold standard, the difference you can see on the face of a banknote. So uh, back in 1950, uh, Federal Reserve notes were still redeemable for silver coin. And so it said on the face of the banknote, this is a little contract, we'll pay the bearer on demand $100, where $100 meant 100 silver dollars. Uh, when that was eliminated, so here's a Federal Reserve note of 1993, the promise, we'll pay the bearer on demand, was just replaced by ribbon, 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 $100. <laughs> so we declare that this is $100. We're not promising you anything except that this is $100. So that's a fiat standard, money by decree. How did we get to fiat standards? We all know, of course, that historically, gold and silver standards, silver particularly, emerge out of centuries of trade and displaced other commodity monies that had emerged in sort of isolated pockets. In some places you had Money consisted of shells or barley or peppercorns. But over millennia, silver in particular was found more convenient. Of course, the monetary unit in the UAE, the dirham, was originally a silver coin. Uh, and so we still have some of the names associated with gold and silver standards, uh, but they no longer mean what they used to. The leaving of the commodity standards came for most of the world, uh, most of the developed world at least, in the First World War. So the combatant nations of Europe all left the gold standard and never really returned in any serious way. There were some sporadic attempts between the war, world wars, but the, that was basically the death of it, except the U.S. dollar remained redeemable for gold. Um, in the middle of the Great Depression, the U.S. government re restricted the redeemability of the dollar so that U.S. citizens could no longer own uh, to redeem their Federal Reserve notes for gold coins. In fact, they made it illegal to own uh, gold coins. Citizens had to turn in their money. After the Second World War, the dollar was redeemable for gold at $35 an ounce, and all the other major currencies in the world were pegged to the U.S. dollar. So there's a kind of a tenuous link a, a, to gold at one remove. It's a gold exchange standard for other countries. It's a, an attenuated gold standard in the U.S. in the sense that U.S. citizens couldn't put the Federal Reserve to the test as to whether they would actually redeem. But once you have a central bank, once you have an institution that holds all the gold reserves and has a monopoly on circulating currency, if it decides to sever the redeemability of the money into gold, uh, the game is over. There's nowhere else you can turn. And people continue to accept central bank money, even though it's no longer redeemable, because what's the alternative? 
as I said, the alternative of, of going back to a gold coin standard and letting the dollar float against gold, that was ruled out by confiscating all the gold coins. More often, uh, a measure like that isn't taken, but simply the fiat money is declared legal tender for all debts, public and private, which means that if you have a debt denominated in marks or pounds or dirhams or dollars, you can now pay it with the fiat money. The creditor can no longer demand to be repaid in precious metal. The fiat money sinks against gold or silver. It's not worth as much, right? So the paper dollar is not worth as much as the gold dollar. So you'd be a fool to repay your debts in gold dollars. People use the paper currency. Uh, the creditors being repaid can't go to court and say, when I wrote this contract, the dollar meant gold and now you're giving me paper. The courts will say, sorry, paper is now legal tender for all debts. So you've been paid. And so the precious metal disappears from circulation. You'd be a fool to use it when you don't get any more for it in domestic exchange than you get for the paper dollar. But you get more for it on the international market. So when governments, once they had a monopoly, once central banks had a monopoly, held all the gold reserves and were the only issuers of currency, they could suspend payments and that's the end of the gold standard. So since 1971, 71 is when the U.S. government said we're no longer redeeming dollars even for foreign central banks. Under the Bretton Woods system since 1944, that was the arrangement. The dollar was redeemable and other currencies were redeemable for dollars. But now the dollar is severed from gold. So all the world's currencies are now fiat monies. And there's no, they're not backed by any commodity. There's no obligation to redeem them for any commodity. Some countries have pegged their own currencies to other countries' currencies. And there are some other interesting arrangements that we can talk about, like the European Central Bank, where the fiat money is pan-national, transnational. It's not just one country's, it's a bunch of countries. Anyway, we've got fiat monies. How have they been doing? Well, if we go back 50 years, if we go back to the 70s and early 80s, we see double-digit inflation. But central banks improved their performance after that. So if we look since 2000, uh, here's the inflation rate in the U.S. dollar, and it's pretty much bouncing around a 3% average with some highers, highs and lows. But this period has become known in retrospect as the Great Moderation, well, at least up until the financial crisis of 2008, where inflation was moderate and recessions were mild. But we're not living in that world anymore. Here was inflation uh, in June 2022 20, compared to a year earlier, 9.1%. So the calmness, the moderation uh, has ended. Uh, here's a British pound. They hit over 10% inflation. Eurozone, over 10% inflation. And their central banks have been even slower uh, to respond to try to bring the inflation rate down. Uh, and despite, as Tyler was saying, the European Central Bank on paper having a single mandate, which is price stability, which they interpret as inflation less than 2%. So they have this mandate, but it doesn't really bind their behavior. Uh, nobody fired the head of the European Central Bank for letting inflation hit 10%. No penalty at all. Uh, I looked this up the other day. The, the DRAM is pegged to the U.S. dollar, and the, the peg has been used to bounce around a little bit more, although these are tiny steps, right? These are fractions of a cent. But the fractions have gotten very small. And under a system like that, internationally traded goods priced in dollars are going to go up in price in DROMs when they go up in price in dollars because arbitrage will enforce that when there's a fixed exchange rate between dollars and DROMs. So without looking at measures of local inflation, I predict 
that it's shadowing U.S. dollar inflation, which means it's been less stable recently than it was for a while. So we need to be concerned about that and think about whether there's some better alternative. Why did we have such inflation? Well, this is kind of the story Tyler told, but in meme form. This is uh, Jerome Powell cranking out dollars. Uh, and to some extent, cranking out dollars was an appropriate thing to do when early in the pandemic, people were hoarding dollars and better to give them the dollars to hoard than to have them cut back drastically on their spending. But then uh, the Fed needed to be ready to pull those dollars back out when people started resuming their spending. And they didn't. They were much too slow to do that. And so we got 9% inflation, 10% in Europe and Great Britain. But so far, I've talked about countries that have relatively sound regimes, relatively reliable fiat monies. A lot of the world doesn't have that luxury. Uh, billions of people live in economies where inflation is over 10%. And here, economies where it's more than 30% uh, last year. And there people are being very poorly served by fiat money. And almost any other system would be better than living through triple digit inflation because it really disrupts, deranges the economy, makes it impossible to conduct economic calculation in any reliable way. Uh, and people are forced to take drastic measures not to hold money because it melts away so rapidly that they even resort to barter uh, in some cases. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a second. But to indicate that I'm not just cherry picking one year or one small group of countries, uh, here's the most comprehensive study I know by uh, Rolnick and Weber it was a published in the Journal of Political Economy, but this chart is from a working paper version. Somehow didn't make it into the final publication. But what I like about the chart is that it shows you quite graphically, if you can read it, I'm sure you can't read the names of the countries, but here's a bunch of different countries. And for each country, the black bar is what their inflation rate was under gold and silver standards. And this dotted line is at zero. So they're all pretty close to zero. And it's a characteristic of the gold standard that the inflation rate can't go far from zero because there are self-correcting forces. I'll come back to those in a minute. And then the lighter bars are their uh, experience under fiat monies. And the inflation rates are higher in every country. So this is a pretty universal phenomenon that if you institute a fiat money, you get higher inflation. Although in principle, it doesn't need to be that way. Because in principle, a central bank can control the quantity of fiat money, however it likes, in order to get the inflation rate it wants. And so in principle, you can get zero inflation under a fiat money if it's properly managed. You could even get mild deflation, which was actually what Milton Friedman recommended in his ideal world thinking as the monetary policy that would place the least burden on money holders by giving them a real, a positive real rate of return just from holding money. Um, and in the limit, the efficient system is one where you get the same return holding Federal Reserve notes as you get holding Treasury bills. Uh, but that hasn't been the experience anywhere. Some countries are better than others. Japan and Switzerland are the sort of outstanding cases of low inflation. But Everywhere it's been higher than under fiat money, sorry, than under gold and silver standards. Now, uh, in defense of fiat standards, it's often said, okay, okay, they haven't been good about keeping inflation down to the same level, but haven't they given us financial stability? Uh, turns out, no. Turns out, if you look at historical experience and compare the track record of central banks to the track record of the economy under the previous system, under the classical gold standard, business cycles have not gotten milder. Uh, that may surprise you, but 
because uh, at least in the United States, famously, there were big financial crises under the classical gold standard. But that was largely due to our weak banking system, uh, which Tyler talked about yesterday. Uh, you didn't have those problems in Canada, which had a better banking system. But uh, even tossing, even looking at the U.S., which had a relatively weak banking system under the classical gold standard, business cycles have not gotten better under the reign of the Federal Reserve and its pursuing a monetary policy. Now, for the first part of the Fed's lifespan up to 1971, you could say, well, it was still under a gold standard. Okay. But if we toss that out and just look at the post-war experience of the Fed, where the gold standard was not really constraining monetary policy, the reason the U.S. had to give up the gold standard, had to give up redeemability at $35 an ounce, was the Fed printed more dollars than were consistent with redeeming them all at $35, or even redeeming the ones that were brought in for redemption. Uh, in other words, they first created the inflation that made the purchasing power of the dollar less than the purchasing power of the equivalent amount of gold. And when European central banks started redeeming their dollars for gold, U.S. Treasury ran out of gold. Uh, but back to financial stability. So in a paper with a couple of co-authors, uh, we looked at this, looked at measures of the volatility of the economy, just simple things like the variance of real output, and it hasn't improved, which is kind of surprising because the economy is much more diversified now than it was between 1880 and 1914. It was a largely agricultural economy then, uh, much more diversified now, and yet variation in aggregate output hasn't uh, become less volatile. All right, so we can't rely on central banks to... Uh, diminish the amplitude of business cycles, which is consistent with lots of different theories of what's causing business cycles. Um, I don't have to take a position on that, but it would make sense to say the central bank has one job under a fiat money system, which is to preserve the purchasing power of the monetary unit, to hold inflation down, uh, preserve purchasing power stability. So how do we do that? How do we control the inflation rate? Well, control growth in the quantity of money. That's the lever the central bank has. Uh, Bob Borns has already referred to uh, Milton Friedman's famous uh, statement that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And stated that baldly, it needs some qualification. And the qualification is every sizable inflation has been due to excessive growth in the quantity of money. If you're talking about variations of inflation between 2% and 3%, that's not necessarily due to faster growth in the money supply. It could be due to an increase in velocity or a reduction in real output. All right, so the, the famous equation of exchange tells you that the price level is determined by, in, in rough terms, how many dollars or how many monetary units are chasing real goods. So it can either be due to, higher inflation can either be due to faster growth in the money supply or slower growth in the output of goods and services. And so for small variations in inflation, it could be due to changes in output growth or it could be due to changes in how eagerly people are pursuing, that is the velocity of money. But if we're talking about sizable changes in inflation and if we're talking about changes that persist for a decade or more, it's got to be differences in money growth. So if you look across countries, these countries with triple-digit inflation have triple-digit money growth. There's no other way to do it. If you look across decades for any one country, the decades of high inflation are going to be decades of high money growth. The other factors are, they bounce around. They don't, you don't have a chronic trend of rising velocity or a chronic trend of shrinking real output. So you need to control growth in the quantity of money. That's the central bank's job. If they want to keep inflation down, do they want to preserve the stability of the purchasing power of the monetary unit? How do you do that? 
Well, for years, the approach of economists, uh, especially under Keynesian thinking, has been persuade the central bank to pursue the right mix of policy goals and targets. But that doesn't seem to be working. Uh, and I think especially if uh, the central bank is getting lots of advice to do lots of different things from lots of different people, they can pick and choose. And it doesn't really get the outcome that you might want. Uh, one way to think about this is that central banks are institutions that like households or like business firms have goals and objectives and have faced constraints in achieving those goals. So they can be thought of as optimizing decision makers. They, they're already looking at costs and benefits and deciding what to do. So if you give unsolicited advice to a household, you should spend more on this and less on that. They're going to ignore you. If you tell a business firm, you know, you should uh, pursue this and not that, they're going to say, we already looked at that and we've decided that this is the most profitable thing to do. Likewise, you get unsolicited advice to a central bank. What reason do they have to take it? They're already pursuing some goal. So you need to constrain central banks to get them to pursue the goal that you, the money holder who wants to preserve the purchasing power of your money, you have to make that their, their one goal by giving them instructions and enforcing those instructions. A well-known example, uh, the first central bank to be given an inflation target was the Central Reserve Bank of New Zealand. They were chugging along at about 14% inflation in New Zealand, and the legislature said, oh, this is not good. And I'm not exactly sure who convinced them that this was a good idea, but they said to the central bank, look, you're, you now have a target of 2% inflation, and if you don't hit the target we fire the head of the central bank. Uh, and that uh, got his attention. And they brought inflation down, and they brought it down pretty rapidly without a bit major recession because everybody believed inflation was coming down. Everybody moderated their wage and price behavior. Uh, and there's a, a theoretical explanation of this uh, which is associated with Kidlin and Prescott, who won basically won the Nobel Prize for this article and maybe one other article. But in 1977, they published this article, Rules Rather Than Discretion, making the point that if the central bank really wants to achieve uh, low inflation, they need to be credibly committed to it. Otherwise, you can get into a kind of prisoner's dilemma where the public expects the central bank not to pursue low inflation, but instead to try to goose output or try to bring down unemployment by having demand grow a little faster. But when the public realizes that that's what the central bank's going to do, they raise their expectations of inflation. And that means it's not uh, satisfying those expectations of higher inflation are not going to reduce out, uh, unemployment or boost output because they're already priced in. The, the extra demand is already priced in. So the central bank, to get a real boost, has to fool people. But in equilibrium, you can't fool the public. They're trying to guess what the central bank is going to do. This is Kidlin and Prescott's argument. If they know what the central bank's objective function is, then they can predict what the central bank's going to do. And in equilibrium of this game, all you get is high inflation. You don't get any change in real output or unemployment because the public's not being fooled. And the central bank, in a sense, is trapped into high inflation because if the public expects high inflation and you give low inflation, then you get a recession. You don't want that. So this is advice that Kidlin and Prescott are giving to policymakers, as right there in the abstract. It's not, it, but it's advice... It, and they talk about a commitment, but they're pretty vague about how firm, how strict the commitment is. But it's a, the proposal is a rule to limit the options of the government money issuers. There is a second approach to constraining uh, central banks, 
Uh, and that's associated with Friedrich Hayek's uh, work a year earlier. Uh, he published this pamphlet, the first edition. There's a second edition, which is available online, uh, expanded, takes into account criticisms. His proposal for what he called the denationalization of money. And what is the proposal? So the first version was pretty modest. Hayek says, look, we have double-digit inflation. Another way to look at that is we have low-quality money. Got lousy money. Why do we have low quality? Well, what do we rely on for high quality and other goods and services? How do we rely? Uh, how do we get high quality automobiles? We have competition among different providers, and if you're not happy with the automobile you got from one manufacturer, you don't buy from them again. You go to a different manufacturer, and it's very important for car makers to have have a good reputation have people believe that their products are high quality. What do we have in money? We've got a monopoly supplier who doesn't care about reputation, doesn't suffer any penalties if they make the product lousy. So we need to introduce some competition. That's how he's thinking about it. And the first proposal is let people in any country use the, any money that's available in any other country. So what would that mean? That would mean eliminating legal restrictions that say Local banks cannot open accounts in other currencies. That would mean eliminating exchange controls that say you can't trade one currency for another. The second version of the proposal, Hayek gets a little more radical and says, instead of just allowing central banks into this competition, why don't we allow private enterprise? So that's why it's the denationalization of money. Let private issuers issue money and then see what the, the public wants. They will have to compete for public favor. If they want customers, they have to deliver the kind of high quality money that people want. And his prediction is they will promise purchasing power stability. They won't be bound to it. He doesn't predict that anybody will make money redeemable for a basket of goods right, in order to keep the price index constant, but they will be bound by their concern about reputation. And if a, if a money starts to be suspect, its exchange value will fall and the issuer will have to, you know, respond in a way that reassures the public and changes the policy so that the value comes back up. That's his prediction. Uh, now, this idea of having more competition among money issuers has become more salient uh, since 2009 with the arrival of Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin is a denationalized money. Well, it's a potential money. It would like to be a money. I say that because the standard definition of a money is something that's commonly accepted as a medium of exchange, right? People use it to buy goods and services. There's very little of that in the case of Bitcoin. There's some of it. It is a medium of exchange for some purposes. It's not a commonly accepted medium of exchange for many purposes. I used to say I'd never met anybody who was whose salary was paid in Bitcoin. Then I met somebody who worked for the Bitcoin Foundation. So there are a few. Uh, and probably the most important use case for Bitcoin right now uh, is in making international remittances to parties who are not smiled upon by their local governments. Uh, so if you want to send money to a dissident group in Belarus that's fighting against the repressive government, you cannot wire them dollars. Those dollars will not arrive. They are not allowed to have a dollar bank account. The central bank will stop it from getting through. But you can send them Bitcoin. All right? So Bitcoin uh, escapes the censorship of central banks because it has its own payment system. It goes peer to peer, as the expression goes. Now, the people in Belarus are going to have to to use the Bitcoin, have to find somebody who wants to give them local currency in exchange for Bitcoin, but those local markets do exist. So Bitcoin uh, has gone from basically zero in value when it was first launched. People were generating Bitcoins by running the program and didn't really know what to do with them. But somebody introduced an exchange where people who didn't know how to run the program and mine for coins, 
could just buy them. It achieved a positive price. And as the word got out, people thought this is cool and they decided to buy it. The price kept rising. Other people said, oh, there's a rising price. I want to get in on that. Uh, and now it's worth over half a trillion dollars, all the Bitcoin in circulation, which is pretty remarkable. So it's a new asset class. Uh, there are roughly 20 million units in circulation. So at $30,000 each, you get 600 billion, but it's a little less than 20 million and the price is a little less than 30. So we're currently, last time I looked, at about 560 billion. There are other cryptocurrencies, but none of them really promises to become a world currency. And that was the motive for the creators of Bitcoin. They wanted an alternative money. So we can think about whether Bitcoin is really well suited to play the role of a universal currency. The same technology that Bitcoin introduced for making this system possible of a peer-to-peer -peer payment system where the money is just a digital asset, not redeemable for anything, the technical problem they had to solve was if you receive a Bitcoin, it's, it's basically a file. How do you stop people from just doing copy and paste? And now they have two Bitcoins, right? That would be a problem. That's the double spending problem. Well, they figured out how to fix that with their distributed ledger system. Uh, and there are other cryptocurrencies that adopt that feature, but add other features. Uh, Ether, Binance Coin, Ripple, but none of them is sort of motivated. They're motivated by trying to find some niche. But the vision of Bitcoin was to become a, a currency. Uh, but that same technology, the distributed ledger technology, has been adopted by the old alternative currency, which is gold. So you now have digital coin on blockchains. Uh, the earliest was Tether Gold. It's kind of neck and neck with a competitor, Pax Gold, finest gold on blockchain is their slogan. So you can buy and sell it like you buy and sell Bitcoin by going to a crypto exchange. And what are you buying? You're not buying uh, just a digital file. You're buying a claim to gold that's in a vault in Switzerland. Now, there are lots of digital gold offerings, do your diligence before you buy one and make sure they really do have a vault in Switzerland. Uh, and there have been reintroduction of, you might call it gold-based banking, where it's not on a blockchain and it's not sold on exchanges, but you send them your money and they will buy gold and put your name on it and you can transfer it to other people who have accounts at the same business uh, that's the way Glint works. So people are trying to reintroduce uh, the gold standard from the bottom up, you might say, by providing a easily acquirable and spendable form of gold. You don't have to get physical coins. You don't have to worry about storing them. You don't have to carry them around with you. Here's a dramatic example of competition among different standards. Uh, which naturally arises when the local currency is really bad. Yeah. I wanted to ask, um, I, I worked in uh, the Bank of Israel. Okay. Um, You're forgiven. Thank you. I'm not proud of it. Um, they're working today on the digital uh, shekel. Yeah. And I wanted to ask if it goes, it's like, it's in the middle between like Bitcoin and fiat money. So if you can... Um, so lots of central banks are talking about or actually trialing digital central bank digital currency. It's a generic label for it. Uh, no, it's not in between. It's fiat money. It's just a different form of fiat money. So it's a liability of the central bank the same way that currency notes are and the same way that bank deposits on the central bank's books are. So... What's, what's different about central bank digital currency is that central banks have traditionally only done a wholesale business. They manage account transfers among banks. This is a retail product. So everybody is supposed to be able to hold central bank digital currency. And at least in one form where 
what it means is that anybody can open an account on the central bank's books. Uh, it's clearly another central bank liability, but it involves central banks in a retail payment system, which has never been their specialty, has never been their comparative advantage. And so it's hard for me to imagine that it would be efficient. I mean, retail payments are something that belong in the private sector. It's a private good. Um, Central banks can make their own clearing system at the wholesale level more efficient. I'm all for that. But introducing a retail product seems to me like a, a bad idea. It's, it's not going to be more efficient than, well, we have private digital currency now, right? We have WeChat Pay, Alipay, uh, Venmo, Paytm, things like that at the, re at the retail level, and they work quite well. Uh, if there's bottlenecks associated with them, it's on the back end where they have to deal with central banks to clear their payments. So interbank payment clearing can be improved, but that doesn't require a retail product from the central bank. Okay, I was saying uh, really sort of dramatic evidence of choice among monetary standards comes from Venezuela where they had a hyperinflation. And at the peak of it in the gold mining regions of Venezuela, people started using gold again as a method of payment. Right? The Bolivar was losing value so rapidly that almost anything is better. One option is to use the U.S. dollar, but the Venezuelan government went to extraordinary lengths to stop people from acquiring or using dollars for a while. And so people are using actual flakes of gold and so this is a scale that's on the counter of a, right, somebody's buying vitamin C and deodorant with it at an ordinary supermarket. And uh, in the news story that this picture came from, the reporter says, I, I asked the shop owner, how do you know this is genuine gold? He said, I can tell. I, I, got, I got cheated a few times, but now I'm, I can tell. Uh, so he's got a digital scale here to weigh the gold flake. Now, this is a banknote, but 500 bolivars is worth like less than a penny. It's just being used as a wrapper. This is not the money. <laughs> it's just the wrapper. So you see it's got gold flakes that are being portioned out. In the cities in Venezuela, people started using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. So the economy is in chaos. One way to earn a living was to sell your services online. How do you get paid if the government won't let you get receive dollar transfers? You can get paid in Bitcoin. It goes around. It roots around the central bank. So people were getting paid in Bitcoin, selling the Bitcoin locally and using local currency to buy groceries because the grocery stores were still not accepting Bitcoin. Although apparently uh, some pizza huts in Venezuela were accepting Bitcoin payments. All right, so that, that's a, a way to avoid a really bad currency that's losing value rapidly. Use something else. Now, uh, there's a practical limit set by the inconvenience of trying to switch to a new currency when other people haven't yet switched to a new currency. So there's a kind of, I'll come back to this, there's a kind of uh, incumbency advantage. It's not in anybody's interest to go first it's difficult to launch a new currency until the existing one gets really bad. But that's why I have to go to Venezuela to see people using gold again. Now, traditionally or historically, uh, governments took over gold standards. Uh, but before there were central banks, there were gold standards without central banks. There were gold standards in which the ordinary everyday currency banknotes included, were issued by commercial banks. And what disciplined the commercial banks and stopped them from just issuing unlimited number of banknotes, that contract, which I showed you on the face of the Federal Reserve note, will pay the bearer on demand, meaning the commercial bank had an obligation to pay in gold or silver coin to any customer who wanted a redemption. And so they had to be careful about limiting the amount they issued because they're meeting demands every day from other banks who are accepting deposits and payments in 
uh, the first bank's liabilities and then coming to the clearinghouse and saying, you have to pay us. All right, so this kind of redemption system constrained the issues. Now, you might go back a step and say, yeah, but the government monopolized the mint. They are producing the only gold coins. Uh, and that was true going back, not initially, the first mints we know about in ancient Lydia seem to have been mostly private. In uh, ancient India, most of the silver coins are produced by private moneyers. But where they can, governments have taken a monopoly on the minting function, but not because there's a market failure, not to improve the quantity of the co quality of the coins, but why? To make revenue. If you have a monopoly of the mint, you can make a lot of money by charging a high fee for turning raw metal into coins, and you can make an extra bonus by cheating your customers by debasing the currency, reducing the amount of silver in the currency, and declaring that it has the same value. So the history of medieval mints is not a history of better coins, it's a history of worse coins, depreciation, devaluation of the coins over the centuries. Uh, so I have a recent paper studying private mints in the most modern example, not going back to Lydia or ancient India or Merovingian Gaul, where they had private mints because the state got so weak it couldn't enforce a monopoly. But in the uh, United States in the 19th century, there were three gold rushes, and in each of the gold rushes, miners are coming out with gold dust or gold nuggets. What do they do with it? They could try to spend the gold dust, but merchants will say, I don't know what quality this is, so I'm going to not give you a high price for this gold. I'm going to assume that it's low quality gold, otherwise you'll cheat me. And so the miner, in order to get a better deal, might want to ship the gold to the mint, the government mint, and get coins back. But that took weeks and was very expensive. And you had to pay insurance as well as shipping costs. So some entrepreneurs came to where the, mint, uh, where the mines were and said, we'll mint your coins. We'll take your gold and produce our own coins, and those will be easier for you to spend than gold dust because we certify the purity of the gold in the coin and the weight of the coin, and it worked. So these are some coins issued in uh, North Carolina, and it says on it the weight and the purity in, measured in carats, and they don't make up their own units it's denominated in dollars, but a dollar was defined as so many grams of pure gold. Uh, this bigger one is from California, and here it's got the purity, 0 0.880 thousandths, so it's 88% gold, and the other 12% is other metals. Uh, you really don't want a 24 karat gold coin because it's quite soft. And this is a photo of a private mint that operated in Denver when there was a gold rush in Denver, or in Colorado. Okay, so you can privatize even the mints. But let's talk about Bitcoin as a monetary standard. Uh, so it's a feature of a gold standard that the quantity of money is determined by the economics of gold mining. In Bitcoin, it's different. Uh, it's not defined in terms of any commodity. It's not redeemable. It's got no quote-unquote intrinsic value, which is the phrase people use to refer to the non-monetary value of gold. Uh, and it's got no assurance, contrary to Hayek's prediction, that its purchasing power will remain steady. As I said, its great virtue is that it's got its own payment rails. But when it comes to determining the quantity of Bitcoin, it's all pre-programmed. There is a fixed release schedule built into the original source code which anybody can look at online. Uh, it's only going to have a maximum of 21 million units ever minted, and we're currently at a little less than 20 million, so most of it has already been produced. But this device of assuring people that we know how many coins there are going to exist at any point in time, 
uh, right out to the end of all time because it maxes out and never grows. In that We don't reach that maximum until like 100 years from now, but it's going to max out at 21 million units. That acts to assure buyers that they won't have the value taken away from them by a big expansion of the quantity at some point in the future. So it's not a redemption, it's not a money back guarantee, but it's a quantity guarantee. It works like a numbered art print where your assurance that this Picasso print, even though it costs them $5 to put the ink on the paper, is not going to be sold. If you pay $300 for it, it's not going to be sold on you know, the home shopping network for $20 at some point in the future because there's a number at the bottom. This print is number 160 out of 300. That tells you only 300 are ever going to be issued. And that's your assurance that, you know, it's not going to be cheapened by issuing unlimited amounts of it. That's the strategy that Bitcoin uses. Uh, this solves a problem that was identified in an old paper by Ronald Coase. Um, so the, this release schedule is built into the source code. You might call that a monetary constitution, a very explicit monetary constitution. It's not just guidelines the way the European Central Bank Constitution has become. It's actually enforced. Uh, the miners, if they get a majority in favor of some bug fix, can amend the source code. But when it comes to changing the release schedule, they're not going to touch that. So you could say Bitcoin is protected not just by cryptography, but also by game theory. Uh, it's not in the interest of miners to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs, right? to undermine confidence in the quantity limit by messing around with the release schedule. Uh, the whole thing was, was coded up by somebody who called himself or herself or themselves, we don't know, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. To some extent, the designers of Bitcoin were inspired by the model of private money under the gold standard, but they wanted a digital equivalent of gold to avoid the problem of, well, a gold vault can be seized by the government. Uh, Bitcoin can't be seized by the government. And transfers then don't require any trusted intermediary under Bitcoin the way they do under a gold standard. So payments can go peer to peer without there being any central institution that's keeping track of debits and credits the way ordinary bank transfers work. The distributed ledger is keeping track of who owns what Bitcoin. Uh, this is kind of an aside, but kind of a personal interest. My interest in these alternative monetary institutions and specifically Hayek's denationalization of money goes back to when it was published. So in the 1980s and 1990s, I'm writing about these issues, mostly thinking about private gold standards and private banknotes. But I'm one of the few people who's interested in this topic of uh, private alternatives to government money. And so were some other people. So there's a list of some publications. Uh, a guy named Nick Zabo and another guy named Hal Finney. These are libertarian cryptographers, or as they like to call themselves, cypherpunks, where they hope that cryptography will provide secrecy and thereby preserve liberty against intrusive governments. And one of their projects becomes how do we design a money? that the government can't tamper with, uh, that nobody can tamper with, and that will preserve people's privacy and serve as a means of payment. Um, and they came up with the, 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 Nakamoto came up with the quantity commitment as a way of assuring people that the money won't be overissued, which I had already discussed in an old paper, but I didn't foresee that this could actually be harnessed to produce a digital asset um, because I thought people want a money that has a predictable purchasing power. And if it just has a limited quantity, it doesn't have a predictable purchasing power. You know, in art prints, the limit 
gives you more hope that it will appreciate and serve as a speculative investment. So I had a, an exchange with uh, this guy, Hal Finney, uh, in a obscure libertarian magazine, uh, libertarian futurist magazine called Extropy. Extropy is the opposite of entropy. So under Extropy, the world keeps getting better. So they're optimistic. Uh, about the kind of digital money that was then being discussed, uh, which was designed by a cryptographer named David Chom, but this was a private method of transferring claims to fiat money. It's kind of a private digital banknote. It wasn't a new monetary standard. But in our discussion, Finney said, well, it, it could be that there could be an internet native money. And Finney is now considered probably the leading candidate to have been Satoshi Nakamoto. Finney together with Nick Szabo. Uh, uh, so here's them giving credit to me and George Selgin, who's my co-author. All right, so how have other economists responded uh, to Bitcoin? Well, fortunately for me, not a lot of them have picked up on it. So I get more speaking engagements than they do. And I learned early on that nobody was interested in talking about the gold standard anymore. And, and this came home to me when even the few institutions that were composed of gold bugs, people who wanted to restore the gold standard, would invite me to come speak, but they didn't want to hear about the gold standard. They wanted to hear about Bitcoin. I said, okay, I, I have to get up to speed on this topic. Uh, well, here's John Cochran, who has spoken to this uh, seminar uh, on previous occasions. And he says two things in the same paragraph. First, Bitcoin is a pure fiat money whose value comes from limited supply plus the demands, and the demands he identifies are for a private means of payment. Um, and that's right. But then he says it's an electronic version of gold. Now, wait a minute. You just said it was pure fiat money. How can it be an electronic version of gold? Because gold is the opposite of fiat money. Uh, and the price variation should be a warning to economists who long for a return to gold. Well, I'm going to dispute both parts of this sentence. It's not an electronic version of gold if you look at the supply mechanism. It's very different. And because the supply mechanism is very different, the volatility of Bitcoin is not exhibited by a gold standard. Uh, so... That's what I just said. So let me demonstrate that. And I apologize to those of you who are not econ majors for drawing supply and demand curves. But this is my native language for discussing issues of supply and demand. Uh, so here's a simple account of how the gold standard works. We've got a demand curve for monetary gold. We've got a supply curve. The demand is for people who want to use money. Uh, and the higher the purchasing power of gold, the fewer units you need. So it's a downward sloping demand curve. The supply curve is upward sloping because there's non-monetary gold that will be converted to monetary gold if the purchasing power goes up. So people have gold jewelry that they will melt down in coin if it becomes more expensive because you can buy more with the coins to hold it as jewelry. And I used... You might think that's trivial. The World Gold Council estimates that about a third of the new supply of gold for fabrication comes from what they call recycling, which is basically people melting down old jewelry. And the ads you see, send us your gold, uh, increase in frequency as the price of gold goes up because people are more responsive when they get more for their old jewelry. All right, so if there's an increase in demand for money, you move up the supply curve and it increases the purchasing power of gold. So, I don't know, suppose Germany joins the gold standard, sells all their silver, has to buy gold to make a new set of coins. That shock is going to increase the purchasing power of gold. But that's not the end of the story because a higher purchasing power of gold means that in the mining industry, it's now more profitable to dig a little deeper produce more ounces of gold per year 
at the higher purchasing power, the industrial demand for gold is actually smaller, downward sloping demand curve for industrial uses. So now there's a, an excess supply of gold coming out of the mines over what's being taken up by industry. Where does that extra gold go? It goes to the mint. So over time, the quantity of monetary gold is going to increase, and that's the dotted line here. The supply curve is going to shift to the right over time. How far is it going to shift? It's going to keep growing until the purchasing power of gold is back down to the level that clears the flow market, that equates the industrial demand for gold to the output of the mines. So a gold standard has a self-stabilizing mechanism uh, with regard to the purchasing power of gold. And by purchasing power, I mean how many units of goods you get per unit of gold. So it's the inverse of the price level. Right? The price level is how many units of money it takes to buy a basket of goods. All right. So another way to say that is if you connect these two dots, you can say the long run supply curve for gold is flat as long as the cost of gold extraction is not changing. Now, an implication of this is if your economy starts growing faster so that the demand for money starts growing faster and raising the purchasing power of gold, that's going to induce more output from the mines. And I'm kind of proud of this diagram. Uh, I found two sources who were not collaborating. One on the growth in the world gold stock and the other in the growth of real output in gold standard using countries. So the first came from Hugh Rockoff and the second from Angus Madison. And we can divide the period between 1807 and 1913 into two parts in the earlier half. And the, the time series don't exactly match up because they're different sources of data. But in the first half, out, real output's growing at about 2% a year and the supply of money is growing at about 2% a year. So that will give you price stability. In the second half, real output starts growing faster. The Industrial Revolution is catching on. There are all kinds of improvements in technology. If that happened without any change in the growth of the monetary gold stock, you'd have increasing excess demand for money not being satisfied. right? And that would mean you'd have downward fall downward trend in prices or upward trend in the purchasing power of gold. Well, that's not consistent with the economics of gold mining. Purchasing power of gold rising means it pays to dig more gold out of the ground per year, pays to do more prospecting. And so the supply of gold should start growing faster. And in fact, it did. It's when the output grew at two and a half percent a year, the gold stock started growing close to 2.5% a year. So the lesson here is it wasn't a lucky accident that the purchasing power of gold was stable over long horizons. It's built into the economics of gold mining. But here's Bitcoin. Here's the quantity of Bitcoin uh, in circulation. It's uh, determined by the source code. And here's where we are now. Uh, we've mined about a little more than 90%. It's currently growing at 1.79% per year. Uh, you can see from the slope, which is reported separately here, that the rate of growth keeps shrinking. It's They call this the halvenings. It, the growth rate is cut in half every few years. And it eventually maxes out sometime in uh, 2140 at... 21 million Bitcoins. What does that mean for the purchasing power of gold? It means it's very volatile because the quantity does not at all respond, respond to changes in demand. So here's Bitcoin vertical supply curve, no response to changes in the purchasing power. There's nothing programmed into the source code. And Nakamoto said, yeah, I thought about that, but then I would need an oracle to feed real world data in. And I don't know how to do that in a trustworthy way. So it's just fixed at any point in time. So an increase in demand ma makes a big change in the purchasing power. Whereas if the quantity responds, you get a smaller change in purchasing power. That's in the short run. In the long run, the supply curve of gold is practically flat. 
again, assuming that the cost of gold mining is not changing. Whereas Bitcoin, it's all in the price. So this is why I say the volatility in the purchasing power of Bitcoin does not imply similar volatility in the purchasing power of gold. All right, so historically, the gold stock grew slowly, but it grew faster when the purchasing power of gold was high because of some demand increase, and it grew slower if there was uh, either negative change in the supply or, let's see, what else would do it? Uh, a, a sudden discovery that reduced the purchasing power of gold. There were some supply shocks, the California discovery, but it was actually pretty small by fiat money standards. The inflation it caused was less than 1.5% a year for about a dozen years. But Bitcoin, all the action is in the price in response to changes in demand, so purchasing power volatility is built in. So if you own Bitcoin and you don't turn off the alerts, this is what you get. Every day, there's an alert Price of Bitcoin is up 5%, down 5%, up 6%. You got to turn those off. It'll drive you crazy. Here's a chart showing the volatility of Bitcoin. Uh, so this is a variance in the price over a 60-day horizon. And it's much higher than the volatility of the price of gold or the price of the euro uh, in dollars. So gold is a little more volatile than the euro exchange rate, but not by much. But Bitcoin is much higher. And what does that mean? It means you don't want to hold your rent money or your utilities in Bitcoin if, if they're being priced in some other currency because you may lose 10% tomorrow and then you can't pay your bills. Uh, and that makes it difficult to get people to adopt Bitcoin as an everyday medium of exchange. Uh, here's daily volatility where 7% change is and a typical. So, where does that leave us? The kind of competition among monetary standards that Hayek called for faces a kind of a couple of obstacles in displacing the incumbents, which are fiat currencies. One, of course, is legal restrictions. In some countries, they outlaw Bitcoin, like in China. Uh, in others, they restrict its use, or they. And in most countries, they tax it in a way that they don't tax foreign currencies. Uh, so that discourages people from holding it. And if you either have a, a gold account or a Bitcoin account, and you're actively using them, buying and selling, every event is a taxable event because you have to figure out your capital gains tax from the time you acquired that Bitcoin to the time you spent it, or that ounce of gold. So that's a legal restriction. But even apart from that, there's a great incumbency advantage. People are not going to switch the money they use because they want to be a part of a network with other money users. You want to be paid in what you can turn around and easily spend at the grocery store. And the grocery store is not going to start taking all kinds of currencies unless it really pays them to do so. Under hyperinflation, it will pay them to do so, but otherwise, not so much. So, if you want to take market share away from the incumbent currency, the incumbent currency has to be bad. And so we do see spontaneous switch in monies. In Latin America, where inflation is high, you get what's called dollarization, uh, informal dollarization, from the bottom up. People put themselves on a dollar standard because that's a more stable currency and it's got a big trade network. You know you can spend it uh, if you take it. So the U.S. dollar has been the number one alternative in high inflation peso countries. There's a presidential campaign right now in Argentina where the candidate who just, to everyone's surprise, won the first round is calling for dollarization of the Argentine economy, meaning official dollarization. Javier Millet. Yeah. So Argentines already hold 80% of their savings in dollars. Uh, but he's saying, let's just get rid of the peso because nobody wants it. Uh, just causes confusion and chaos. Uh, 
but we're not going to get switches away from the best fiat currencies until they become bad. So it's not something really to hope for, but it's nice to have a fallback plan in case they do uh, go to hell. So what would we switch to? For the reasons I just spelled out, I'm predicting uh, gold would be more popular than Bitcoin. I might be wrong about that. That's a, you know, entrepreneurial prediction. But gold already has a big installed base of users. All the gold in private hands is worth about $12 trillion, whereas all the Bitcoin is about half a trillion. Uh, of this $12 trillion, about half of it is jewelry, and about the other $6 trillion is coins, bullion, ETFs, uh, and central bank reserves. But private ownership of gold is now greater than central bank ownership of gold which is kind of ironic because the argument made for getting off the gold, one of the arguments made for getting off the gold standard was we'll save all these resources that are devoted to gold mining. That was Milton Friedman's argument for preferring fiat money to a gold standard. Of course, to be fair, he wanted a fiat money that was responsibly managed, which we didn't get. And so as an inflation hedge, people started acquiring gold. And that meant we actually spend more resources today producing gold that goes into people's hordes than we did under the gold standard. Uh, and so the real price of gold is high compared to when it was $35 an ounce. So gold has a large installed base. It's less volatile. Bitcoin does have the advantage of greater censorship resistance, but governments, although they can't confiscate it all, and they can't stop all Bitcoin use, people are still using Bitcoin in China, they can drive it underground. If you want to use Bitcoin in China, you better be pretty sophisticated. You can't put out a sign saying, we accept Bitcoin, that's illegal. So it's driven underground, which means not going to become a commonly accepted medium of exchange. So of those two alternatives, I would say gold is more likely. But there are other alternatives, right? So Hayek's vision is still out there. And people are now working on alternative cryptocurrencies that would have a more stable purchasing power. You've probably heard of stable coins, but stable coins are pegged to the US dollar or the euro. So they're not any more stable than the dollar is. An alternative vision is what's called flat coins, where if there's inflation in the dollar, we raise the value of that coin so we keep its purchasing power in terms of goods and services constant. How to design one of these is kind of an open question. Two, uh, well, actually, this is one company. One company issues a coin called Ampleforth, has a derivative called Spot, which is supposed to be a flat coin, a stable purchasing power coin. Another way to do it, instead of pegging, is to have an elastic supply that responds to demand the way the gold standard does. So some people de uh, designing a cryptocurrency who want it actually to be used as a medium of exchange and therefore want a stable purchasing power have hired me to consult with them and they pay me in stable coin. So I've had to get familiar with how that works. Uh, called Prosaga, disclaimer, I'm not speaking here on their behalf. But these are interesting times, right, where somebody trained in monetary economics can be hired by a private firm, not by a central bank, but by a private firm to consult on how to manage this quantity of money so as to preserve the stability of its purchasing power. When I came out of graduate school, only central banks would hire you to talk about that. So it's a new world. Um, so the, the, the idea here is to have the quantity governed in, a, in an automatic way, not discretion, but in an automatic way, by movements of its price so as to stabilize the purchasing power. Uh, the odds of succeeding in any project like this are pretty low, but, you know, we're giving it a shot. And I discovered after the fact that we were encouraged by uh, Vitalik Buterin, who designed uh, Ether. He said, look, uh, Bitcoin is too incorrigibly volatile, there's no correction to it, it's built in, to ever be a stable unit of account. I believe the best route to cryptocurrency price stability is by experimenting with intelligently designed flexible monetary policies. 
That's what we're trying to do at Prasaga. But even bigger picture is that we need to encourage experimentation. Uh, there are open questions, as Nick Zabo says, about crypto technology, which can only be settled by actually putting them out in the field and seeing how they do. So those are the possibilities for the future. In the short run, as long as fiat monies don't break down in high and in triple digit inflation or, or high inflation, which I would define as like 20%, we're not going to see spontaneously people getting off the fiat standards. They're, it's either going to take reform by policymakers to change from a fiat standard to something else, um, or to go back to the original division between competition and rules, we're going to need rules to constrain the uh, quantity of money. I have uh, another book which addresses that question. Uh, issued a few years ago. Well, I helped edit it, but this idea of having binding enforceable rules is also known as a monetary constitution. So we need to keep looking for a monetary constitution that can be adopted and that will endure. In case I said anything odd or controversial, I'd like to take questions. Thank you. Did you have a question? Okay. Yeah. What do you think about the collection now or in future with the cost of mining Bitcoin in the fried to it? Okay, so the question is what's the relationship between the price of Bitcoin and the cost of mining Bitcoin? So the price of anything is determined by supply and demand. And in the case of Bitcoin, the supply is predetermined by the program. So unlike ordinary goods and services, unlike apples or potatoes, you don't have to look at the cost of production to know what the quantity is going to be. And so it's the price of, of producing one Bitcoin, well, if you want to call it that, uh, that's going to be determined by the price of Bitcoin. Right? So people are going to be willing... When you mine Bitcoin, when you enter, you hook up to the network and make your computers available for validating Bitcoin transactions, the system is that whoever solves the math problem that's set by the program wins the right to validate a block of transactions. They get a reward, and the reward is the new Bitcoin that's being introduced. So if the if the reward is worth $60,000, actually these days it's like $130,000, uh, people will spend up to $60,000 to be the expected winner of one Bitcoin. And so when the price of Bitcoin is high, people are plugging in machines even where the cost of electricity is high and you get lots of Bitcoin miners competing to win this lottery. It doesn't affect the supply, but it raises the cost of the marginal Bitcoin uh, miner's operation. When the price of Bitcoin goes down, people unplug the machines that are the most expensive. Uh, so the Bitcoin miners, of course, are going to gravitate to places where the electricity is cheap. And that process is going on. And Sorry? Miners, I said it, but they call that they're going to Yeah, so... Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you might say, excess electricity generated by the hydrothermal uh, in, in Iceland, but it's the quantity of that electricity is limited. There are some Bitcoin advocates who want to make this consumption of electricity a virtue rather than a cost uh, or a benefit rather than a cost, but that's like the mistake that creating jobs is a benefit when it's actually a cost. Using electricity is a cost. The argument for Bitcoin has to be that this is not a waste because there are benefits that justify the cost. And in, particularly in the case of Bitcoin, the benefits and the costs are internalized on the users of Bitcoin. No reason for other people to worry about how much energy Bitcoin uses any more than they worry about how much energy hospitals use or air travel uses. The costs are borne by the users of those services. 
if you think there are externalities associated with the generation of electricity, that it's not the pollution is not priced in properly, your argument is with the electricity industry. It's not with Bitcoin. So people who want to ban Bitcoin because it uses too much energy are just not thinking economically. Uh, thank you, Professor, for being lecture. So my question is, since the fish waiting to central banks to get them reach uh, their goals is it an effective hike actually called for constraining them by introducing some competition. Right. Uh, doesn't that question the their independence by taking from them the power to control the country with one? Yeah, so Hayek's approach doesn't actually call for shutting down central banks, but he hoped that they would be embarrassed if they started losing market share and start behaving better. So he thinks the central banks will kind of work like competitive firms who want to retain their importance. That may not be the case. Uh, and especially in high inflation countries, they don't seem to be embarrassed by their terrible performance. And that's because they're not serving the public. They're serving the fiscal authorities who are telling them, we have employees to pay. Please print the money that we need to pay the employees. So in the cases of really high inflation, it's almost always driven by printing money to uh, cover budget deficits. Um, so yeah, and it, shutting down the central bank has to be a policy decision. The market can't do that. Okay. Question that I'm not sure is answerable, but since it's just being speculative, um, what is the risk that advances in parts of the continuity? Uh, Whatever is going to come out of the deep pike and the Google Plex and elsewhere will basically, in effect, result in digital coin clipping, which they'll figure out at, at the way of Bitcoin is stored, transferred, and other criminal currencies. And, and in the broader question, uh, how does that tilt store of value argument for this gold and wake the brick up? I mean, so I have no expertise in, uh, you know, quantum computing or cryptography, but my cryptographer friends tell me that, well, we can use quantum computing to make harder uh, encryption. So it's an, it's an arms race, though. Uh, yeah, but that, that's all I really know. Yeah. And I give this blimbo for dinner. There's no panic. We did also any graphical way to how to issue the idea that how people are going to take taxes and their network of money is it until you use uh, gold, so that gold as you're using your coconuts. So, did you use any, did you have any practical idea of how this would be? So it is uh, a criticism that I didn't mention of his prediction that he imagines that in the same city you would confront, you know, a dozen different currencies, which is not something we commonly see because it's so inconvenient. Uh, there are some, you know, tourist areas where you might see two currencies being accepted, but not dozens. The uh, old like fixed rate. Yeah, so people can keep track of one exchange rate, but uh, you're placing pretty... Of course, we now have... Everybody's got a cell phone that can do a currency exchange, so maybe it's not such a problem, but... Uh, I think there still is, you know, a strong network effect where under non-pathological conditions, we get convergence to a single money. If you have... As far as the tax authorities go... Uh, they do have, if they're only going to accept one kind of money, then they are enhancing the demand for that money. It doesn't need to be determinative. If you've got a country where taxes are a small share of GDP and they say you have to pay our ta your taxes in this, and, and you see this in some examples where colonial powers introduced a money for paying taxes, and the public said, okay, well, we'll get it the day before taxes are due, but we're not going to, we already have our money for ordinary transactions. But more than country than that tax in the day. But, but yeah, if you're collecting taxes continuously and daily and 
uh, require them to be paid in a certain currency, then that does enhance the demand for that currency. Uh, but if the government is small enough, it doesn't have that much influence. I mean, Walmart determines what currency it accepts. Amazon determines what currencies it accepts. And in so doing, it enhances the demand for those currencies. So if you wanted to make multiple monies feasible, uh, you have to tell your government, look, 80% of us are using dollars. Let us pay our taxes in dollars. And that has happened in some Latin American countries. Uh, in Ecuador, where they dollarized basically from the bottom up until the government, uh, this is because inflation was close to 100%, the government finally said, you know, we're collecting taxes in sucres, but if we tax your income in sucres and you you pay us uh, like on April 1st for the income you earned last year, the sucre has lost 90% of its value between last year and April. Our real tax revenue is nothing. We'd be better off if we collected taxes in dollars. Sorry? I, sorry. Didn't, okay. So it becomes in the fiscal authority's interest to switch to a money that doesn't melt away on them either. Yeah. Well, thanks for the next chat. Um, it's for both of us felt of shredding the backs of rules and all about enroll money in and uh, to a way this one. I don't know who the main the knows at all in, in about um, and can be able to print the London and back and uh, from yeah, so in the free banking systems, so-called, that I have studied, there was no mandatory reserve requirement. That was up to the banks. but uh, And there were no mandatory capital requirements. But the banks did face a skeptical public, so they had to persuade them that our brand of banknotes will actually pay you on demand. And so they did have to keep reserves for, for prudential reasons, and they had to be prepared to replenish those reserves if they started to run out. Uh, and so the banks held safe, liquid asset portfolios so they could sell them without suffering losses in, in the event they needed to, or they needed to have some arrangements to borrow money on short notice. And uh, clearinghouse associations in the United States sometimes would lend money to a member that was so, fundamentally solvent, but has was losing reserves because the public was skeptical. Um, so there are sort of backup systems in place, but no, it it relied on market incentives for banks not to overissue. Um, and a, a bank that overissued would find itself losing reserves, and if it didn't respond by changing policy by contracting, uh, eventually the they run out of reserves and they have to default. And then there were severe penalties, namely we shut you down if you don't um, uh, deliver on your promise to pay. Uh, 